All right, well, hey, so uh, one of the really cool things uh, that I want to talk to you about tonight is just we're continuing this series called Be Christmas. Uh, if you're on social media, you may have actually saw this earlier. Um, Connie, uh, Mike's wife, was actually supposed to speak tonight uh, and teach this evening. Uh, she had really sick this afternoon, and so she actually, uh, unfortunately, won't obviously be able to teach. Uh, so uh, there is this thing called the power of the Holy Spirit that we believe in, um, and practically speaking, it's helpful in these moments because, uh, honestly, no one had anything prepared, right, because Connie was supposed to teach tonight. Um, and so uh, give me a little bit of grace tonight, but I do think that just in light of kind of where we are as a church and where we're going, there's some really cool things that I want to kind of hopefully bring to you this evening that I think the Lord wants to share with us as a community. Uh, I really, uh, I can't stress this enough as a church for us right now. There's a lot of things that are happening that it's easy for us just to breeze over, right? I want to use the analogy of a speed bump. Uh, how many of you guys, uh, when you're, especially at night, you're not paying attention, you're you're not texting your phone, right? You would never do that while you're driving. But let's just say you weren't doing that, and all of a sudden you ran over a speed bump, right? It can catch you off guard, right, if you're not careful. Or it can also damage your car if you go over enough of those things fast enough, right? How many of you guys ever run over a speed bump and, like, did not see it? You just were, like, not paying attention or all of a sudden, really, like, five people? Come on, everybody, like, has been over a speed bump before, right? Lonnie a lot of times, apparently. All right, so, all right, but they can catch you off guard, right? The purpose of a speed bump, functionally, right, is that you and I, we slow down operating the car, and then we slowly go over the speed bump, and then we continue to go, right? That's the basic, fundamental principle of a speed bump, Right? In case you didn't know that, that's a really important thing for some of you practically to hear, that you're supposed to slow down, slowly go over the speed bump, and then continue your normal speed, right? That's the idea of it. Maybe that's an important place just to highlight for some of you tonight, but I think you guys all get the idea of it. The point of what I want to say about us for Awakened Church is that we're going through a speed bump right now as a church. I don't mean that negatively. I mean that in a positive way. Like God's trying to do some really cool things in our church right now. And it's very easy for us, especially as people who've called Awaken home for a long time, or people that are just Christ followers and they've been a part of a church for a long time, just to like just breeze through some of these things. There are these things in our lives that God does sometimes. Uh, the Greek word is this idea of a kairos moment. There's these moments in time where it's not, it's an event. It's not just a chronological time, chronos, it's kairos, a moment in time. And we have these kairos moments that occur for us as Christians where we stop, we slow down, and God's trying to teach us something in the moment. And for us as a church, part of what you've seen, if you've been with us since we made the move to VB1 the weekend of Labor Day, we did a series called Start, right? We talked about this idea of let's start doing some things differently. Then we did a series called Messy Church. We talked about this idea that we will be a church that lives and exists in the midst of messiness. Messy beliefs, messy functionality, all of it's messy. Yes, God's a God of order and structure, but man, God loves to exist in the midst of chaos. That God's not here to fix us. He's here to make us whole. There's a very different difference in those two things, right? We talked about this idea of, of being thankful, right? We talked about all these different things over the last, and they're all intentionally chosen for a reason. The reason why we chose this idea of Be Christmas is obviously it's a holiday-themed message series, but there's something for each of us, especially around this idea of Christmas, where we get, so, um, we get so trained to be on autopilot. We know when the holidays are. We know the family events to go to. You have a work party. You have gifts to buy. You have white elephant. You got these things going on. You have all the things on autopilot. And what's so easy for us is just to blow through the speed bump. When God intentionally in our calendar, chronos, the time of the year, puts something in our life to cause a kairos, an event. An event where we stop and pause and we say, God, what are you trying to teach me right now? And it's so important that it's actually part of our church calendar every year, right? It's not just the world calendar. It's part of our church calendar for a reason because it causes us to stop reorient and reposture ourselves around something special. And if you're like me, I'll just preach to myself for a second. I am guilty of this every year where I've lost the childlike awe and wonder of what happens right now. And so part of, for me, every year around Christmas is I've got to realize, okay, I've gotten so headstrong in one direction, I was doing things over and over again, tunnel vision, if you will, that I've lost the heart 
of who I am and what I'm doing. If you were here last week, we started this series called Be Christmas, and I talked about this idea of being present. And one of my greatest fears, as I shared last week, is that we would operate as isolated individuals that just meet together versus doing life together as a family. The difference in doing life together as a family and meeting together as isolated individuals is simply about your heart and attitude, right? The power of presence that we carry with us. Emmanuel, God with us, the power of presence. So tonight, I want to piggyback off of that tonight. I want to talk about this idea of being in awe, being in wonder. I want to read you this uh, passage from the message version from Luke. I just want to kind of kick us off this way for a few minutes while I share my heart. It says, your eye is a lamp. Should be up on the screen for you guys here, the message version. This is Luke uh, chapter 11, 33 through 35. Uh, no one lights a lamp, then hides it under a drawer. Uh, it is, uh, it's put on a lampstand, so those entering the room have light to see where they're going. Your eye is a lamp lighting up your whole body. If you lived wide-eyed in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a dank cellar. Keep your eyes open, your lamp burning, so you don't get musty and murky. Keep your life as well lit as your best lit room, best lighted room. Lit room? I don't know. I'm definitely not the English guy. Let me just admit that myself before someone else does. So that's important. All right, so. But at the end of the day, right, I mean, part of what this is, this, this message version I want to read, the reason why I read this is because there's something unique that, that lights up within us, right? It should at least. It should light within us. Um, Lindsay teases me sometimes to use this phrase with it when I teach about this idea that we all have calluses on our heart and that God needs to take some sandpaper to our hearts. And it's a little too graphic for Lindsay. She's like, can you not use sandpaper and calluses on my heart? Like, can you find a better version? But like, I like the graphicness of it, so I keep using it. Um, but within all that, there's, it's true, we've become numb, right? We can all agree, we've become numb to parts of the story. Right, the Christmas story at large, let's just think about it for one second. The basic fundamental elevator speech of Christmas is that God chose to send himself in the form of a child in a dirty, gross barn to imperfect people through a woman who had never had sex before to be a savior in a world that was looking for a king and instead they got a messiah right that's the core of the christmas message can we agree but somehow it becomes about so many other things. And I'm not, my, 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 my house is decorated. I play Christmas music all day today, uh, which is a big deal for me. So like, I am, I am in it right now. I talked about last week, God's doing a work on me. So it's happening. I appreciate your prayers on that. But in all reality, like, I love the Christmas season. But part of for me that I have to reorient myself, reposture myself, is simply this. I have lost the awe and wonder of what God's trying to do. I've lost this idea of just being in awe of what God's trying to do. That God wants to do miracles, and God is a God of miracles. So right now, I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know what's happened to you last week, the last month, maybe the whole 2018 for you. But what I want to encourage you tonight with is one important message that the God I believe in is a God of miracles. That God wants to do something miraculous in your life individually, but also in our family at large here at Awaken. And if you don't believe in miracles, it's because you've become numb to the story. It's as simple as that. What happens is, if you think about the Pharisees, right? Let's just pause for a second. The Pharisees, they hounded Jesus religiously, about how often he did humanity and God in one incorrectly. The Pharisees regularly corrected Jesus about how he was doing God and humanity and one person incorrectly. Right? One of the classic examples I'll just give you, and I'm not going to teach you a bunch of references tonight, but there's several we can point to. Jesus one day heals someone on the Sabbath, the day that you're not supposed to do anything. So within the Jewish culture, you literally do nothing this day, right? It is a sacred day. It's set aside. There are certain things you, do, you can do and most things you cannot do. 
work and labor is one of those things. The Pharisees accused Jesus of healing a man on the Sabbath. And we're guilty of this every day because essentially it's the same principle of trying to put God into our boxes. And what ends up happening is that we begin to control and filter the message and the person through what we want him to be instead of allowing God to be this God of miracles, this God that brings awe and wonder to our life. So we are so guilty at times of this idea of just controlling everything. Philip Yancey, a well-known author, says it this way. He says, there's two different ways to look at the world. One, take, one takes the world apart and separates everything, while the other seeks to connect it and put it all together. He goes on to say that we live in an age that excels at the first and falters at the second. Similarly, there's two ways to approach God. One approach takes, God's, takes God apart. We make God manageable and measurable. We reduce God to a set of propositions, seal tight theologies, or divine formulas. We fall into the trap of reductionism. Basically what he's saying is that if we're not careful, we try and minimize God into this box, right? Into a God that never surprises us, never overwhelms us never brings us back to our knees as a kid of awe and wonder. I have a three-year-old daughter. Her favorite phrase for the last week or so has been, oh my gosh! And she says it like she just saw the most amazing thing, right? We were FaceTiming with Nana, my mom, this morning, having banana pancakes this morning. And she had this big banana pancake piece and she saw it and she was like, oh my gosh, Nana, look! right? And I, I say that's a simple illustration, right? But it's this basic idea that like, my daughter's amazed at everything right now. Even stupid, silly banana pancakes, right? And it's so easy for me to laugh at her instead of appreciate it in her, right? I'm her dad, right? It's cute, right? I mean, it's cute, right? But like, it, after a week and a half, guys, like the one story's great, but like, oh my, okay, and me enough, like really, like it's not an oh my gosh moment, like settle down, right? But the truth is, that's, that's what my life should be like as a Christ follower, right? Like, I should be living and walking around every day saying, oh my gosh, look at what God did. You see, it starts every day with this understanding that I woke up entitled to have the breath that I have. And it ends that I'm entitled to have a roof over my head to put it down at night. And all throughout the day, I live as an entitled person who thinks I'm in control and God's here to serve me. And unless I'm careful and strategic, that repeats itself on autopilot every day. But what breaks the mold, the numbness, the calluses, is when I remember, if I'm reminded in my life of something that God does to break me out of that, and I have this, oh my gosh moment, look what God's doing. My hope in the Christmas message is that you don't just read it. You don't just recall what happened. But there's something that ignites this wow and awe and wonder for you. Like a child. The, the idea of waking up on Christmas morning, right? I mean, you can remember what that was like as a child, right? I mean, for me, we had a strict rule. You couldn't go downstairs until at least 6.30, and then at that point, you had to open up gifts, and I have two other brothers, and so once they came around, it was like, Philip, then Joel, then Adam, then Philip, then Joel. I'm like, just let me open up all my gifts. Like, I was here first, so I'm the oldest, right? Opposite problem. Like, I'm loud. People hear me all the time anyway, so like, I, I don't like sharing or waiting in line. That's not my thing. I feel special. I'm the oldest, right? Hence of entitlement, so I get that. Like, open sin. I'm admitting to you guys, right? confession hour of the pastor but at the end of the day like I I remember what it was like to to be in awe and wonder but man I'm just as guilty of the next person sometimes of forgetting that the last quote I want to read you tonight is actually from someone who was not a believer Albert Einstein he says it this way the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious it is the source of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe 
is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. Interesting. A man of calculations, a man of science, appreciated and in many ways idolized this idea of mysterious because of the power it caused him to remember that he's not in control. Part of remembering the story of Christmas for me, and maybe for you as well in the series, and in life in general, obviously, is that part of being Christmas is about being not in control. That God would choose to be Emmanuel, God with us, to be fully present in our life. And in the midst of that, he chose to embody this innocent child one that we would call Jesus. What we lose as Western civilized Americans is a Jewish context. In the Jewish culture, it was so sacred to think about God as anything other than a sovereign being, they wouldn't even mention his name. They used They enunciated his name through syllables. They would not even say the name of God. So this is the audacity to suggest that God would choose to put on flesh and skin and move into the neighborhood is absolutely against everything the Jewish people believed. And yet he convinced a small number of Jewish people to not only follow him, but to change the world in light of the message. So for each of us tonight, it's a different night tonight. I want to, I want to end on this final thought. We have these three stations up here that we regularly go to as a part of worship. And if you're new to Awaken, I just want to kind of stop for a minute and explain them to you because they're sacred to our community. But they're not sacred because they're meant to be elevated above anything. They're meant to be embraced by everyone. So there are three stations that we have. I'm going to do them from this side of the room, if you're you're not aware. We have a cross. And this cross is up here, as you can see. We've done this ever since we moved to VB1. There are sticky notes. And people have written everything from prayer requests, things that they're wrestling with, people's names, fears. And they take a moment just to stop and say, God, where can I surrender this over to you because I'm carrying something around in my life that I need to leave at the foot of the cross. For some of you, this is a weekly uh, place of worship, right? This is something you celebrate doing weekly because it's a moment for you to reposture yourself similarly to the message tonight as a reminder that that you're carrying something that wasn't designed for for you to carry because you're still trying to be in control and you're not submitting to the God of mystery the God of wonder, the God of miracles. So for some of you, you have to release that. But maybe for some of us tonight, there's this idea of just of repenting, right? Acknowledging there's something within us that we have to let go and realize that we were in the wrong. And, and I'm not even talking about like billboard sins, right? I mean, maybe that's where you're coming in tonight, and that's, that's fine. This is still a safe place for you. But I'm talking about just the heart of pride, right? The heart of entitlement, whatever it is for you. And so we created the station, which has these stones up here, and there's markers, and you write on the stones whatever you want to, and then you dip it in the bowl of water, and you wash it away. They're washable markers, spoiler alert. And they're designed to help you remember as symbolism that God takes something that you feel guilt or shame about. And like the psalmist says, to cast it as far as the east is from the west. Because my God is a God of forgiveness. Tonight, where I want to finish tonight is to talk about the Lord's Supper, communion. Maybe you grew up going to church and this was a a cardboard wafer and a small little peel-back grape juice cup. Maybe it was a, a priest standing in the center of the room with cup of wine and bread. Maybe you've never taken the Lord's Supper before. 
The reason why we have this element here every week is a reminder of something very sacred to our church. That we are human and we need a Savior. We need Emmanuel, God with us. We don't need a king. We need a Messiah first and foremost. And that's why Jesus came. Yes, Jesus is our king. But his kingship looks very different than what the Jewish people were looking for, right? His kingship came in the form of an innocent child, teaching us what it meant to do life, to live among the people, not to rule and reign, but to love and to serve. And we're reminded of that when we as believers, people who are a part of God's family, take the elements here that are a reminder of a sacred meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. Biblically, Jesus says, throughout scripture to do this as often as you gather and so we chose about a year and a half ago to make this an element a part of our gathering every week now you don't have to take part in every week right it's a it's an element up here that you're able to do if you want to i personally choose to do it every week because for me again it's about reorienting my heart it's about a posture and god knows i need it every week right There's something sacred and special about these elements. And so tonight, what I'm going to ask us to do that's probably different than what we normally do, at least we haven't done here at VB1 since we've been here since Labor Day weekend, is tonight as a church, we're going to take communion together. We're going to pause and recalibrate ourselves, realign ourselves. There's a spiritual chiropractor in the room called the Holy Spirit. He wants to do something in our lives. And in the process of doing that, we're going to be reminded of a God of wonder, a God of mystery, a God of miracles. Because you're not in control as much as you'd like to be. I'm not in control as much as I'd like to be. But I serve a God who is absolutely holding your life and my life in the palm of his hands. And so tonight, I'm choosing to surrender my life to submit to the Christmas story because I believe that God came, lived a perfect life, took the sins of humanity upon himself, conquered sin and death on the grave, on the cross, rose again three days later, and invites me and you to tell that story today through our words, our actions, our attitudes. And if that message doesn't invoke this all in wonder within us, then tonight I hope that you stop for just a second because you've gone through the business of the week, the chaos of your problems, the struggle of your pain, and you've lost the all in wonder. You've lost the thing that brings you back to the cross and says, okay, this is why I'm here. As Mike shared, there's a story, right, that tells the vision of where we're going as a church. The power of taking communion tonight is about taking our life and looking at a story that's been told for thousands of years, that's being told here and now, and will be told for the rest of eternity. And it's a story of God choosing to be one of us, to be in relationship with us, and choosing our story to be a part of his story. But if we think it's just about us, you can sit here, you can sing some songs and leave and it won't change you. No powerful sermon, no song we'll sing will change you. No MC attendance will change you. No amount of money that you'll give will save you. The only thing that I believe that will change you is the power of the Holy Spirit through the reminder of the love of Christ. And tonight we do that through the power of communion. So as you're ready and able to tonight, we're going to sing a few songs here to end. We'll take offering up at some point towards the end. But at some point at your own posture, if you call yourself a Christ follower, you're a part of the family of God, whether you call awake and home or not is irrelevant. I could care less about that. What I care about is whether or not you are a believer, I would invite you to reorient yourself tonight and take communion. I want to invite Mike to come up here and we're going to hold the elements together. We're just going to pray for you. 
uh, silently, not in front of you, just silently pray over you as you take the elements in this moment. So let me pray and we'll stand and worship. God, tonight as a church, we take communion symbolically as a reminder of the fact that you're not only present here in our community, but that you are a God who loves us so intimately. You're a God who tries to, to wow us every day. And instead, we turn on the, the car radio, we drive from place to place, and we go to sleep, and we do it all over again the next day. But God, may the very breath of life in the morning give us an, oh my gosh, I get another day. With the miracles that you're trying to do in our life, would they cause awe and wonder? Would the story of Christmas bring us back to a child of wonder? And God, I pray for my friends in this room tonight, God, that need a miracle. The people in this room who sit here in doubt whether or not there's a God of miracles out there. And God, I pray whether it's through a person, through nature, through scripture, through community, through whatever it is, God, that you would bring about a revelation within their heart and their mind that you are a God of miracles and that you move miraculously. Would you ignite this all in wonder like a child within our hearts, God? And as we read through the message and the story of Christmas over these next few weeks, would you can cause us to continue to be that message to the world around us? Because this isn't just about me. It's about me being a vessel and a vehicle for the rest of the world to see the Christmas message. So God, I ask for forgiveness tonight as we approached the cup and the bread. Would you forgive us? Forgive myself of moments of entitlement, God, where I, I think you're here to serve me instead of the other way around. So God, we worship in this moment with a heart of humility, a heart of awe and wonder, and a heart of love, because that's what you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and worship?